Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Hey. Taisha Tyler. The Tribe Called Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz. Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Ow! Hello and welcome to the Talk House Podcast. I'm Josh Modell. On this week's episode, we've got a hardcore legend and a fierce Ukrainian band leader who recently worked on a record together, Walter Schreifels and Eugene Hutz. Now, Hutz is the founder, chief songwriter, and energetic frontman of Gogol Bordello, which has combined elements of punk, folk, Eastern European, Latin, and myriad other types of music for the past 20 plus years. It's a remarkable career that's taken Hutz from his birthplace, Ukraine, to places as far flung as Vermont, Brazil, and New York's Lower East Side. He's also had forays into the film world, collaborated with everybody from Madonna to Primus, and gotten crowds jumping at pretty much every festival you could think of. The war in Ukraine has naturally been on Hutz's mind, and he's organized benefits and spoken up loudly about it this past year. At least one song on the brand new Gogol Bordello album addresses it directly. Speaking of that record, Sala Dartin, and Hutz's penchant for collaboration, it was produced by Walter Schreifels. Check out a little bit of the track, Fire on Ice Floor. Nobody cares if you know it all. Nobody wants what they can control But dance, 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 dance Around the fire uh-huh. So much to do for nowhere to go So much to say for not much to know Located directly in a greater unknown We dance, 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 dance. Around the fire Now, Schreifels isn't just a producer. In fact, that job is probably like the 10th thing on his impressive resume. He was a pioneer of the New York hardcore scene as a member of both Youth of Today and Gorilla Biscuits. And from there, he went on to sing and play guitar in Quicksand. A restless writer and performer, Schreifels formed half a dozen short-lived projects over the past couple of decades, in addition to reuniting sporadically with his various other bands. Quicksand has released two great albums since getting back together in 2012, and they're heading out on a package tour soon with Clutch and Helmet. There's also a reissue of a great record by another of Schreifel's short-lived projects, Rival Schools, coming later this year. It's hard to keep track of everything he does, but well worth the effort. These two NYC pals talk here about the city's importance and vibe, as well as getting into deeper conversation about the war in Ukraine, how running can help prepare you for being in a punk band, and about how the pandemic might have led people back to hardcore music. Enjoy. Long time no see. <laughs> it has been a minute, a few days. You're always coming from somewhere and going somewhere. Yeah, you yeah. and I both, man. It's a gypsy life, bro. Maybe probably overcompensating for the time. We all global wise spent indoors and uh, now we're like out all the time and getting shit done. I kind of feel like it's getting back up to speed, to be honest. The swing is back, a friend of ours visiting from Berlin. Uh And he was like so set on this idea. I'm going to go back in New York City just to get the swing back on, to jumpstart my life again. Yeah. And he came here and he was like, yeah, it's totally that place with that swing. Right now in 2022, it's happening the way I want it to be on. It's just a kind of cool reminder that yeah, that it, it is that place. I agree, man. I don't know if it's just my my own personal trip and like where I'm at in my life where I'm just like, I don't know, you know, it's sort of flat in some ways or like maybe I'm not part of that excitement, but I do feel like right now New York has a great vibe. I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm feeling it. Every time I go out, I run into. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, but the last time was in the uh, in organic grill. We had a there was a little gathering for your renaissance moment. Yeah, you know, it seems like you're touring with like every band that you've ever been in in same time. <laughs> yeah, that was really nice at organic grill. Like, uh, it's just we're talking about New York, like these kind of like old. I mean, you know, it's been there for a while. He's like a real you know guy making the food at his restaurant, and uh, you know they got this new location. And uh, he's making vegan food with his wife, Olga, like real people just doing stuff on their own, on their own steam and building a community. Absolutely. Just really cool to be a part of that. And like, you know, through doing all the, the music stuff that I've done and just living in New York and knowing people for all this time, like that I get invited to do that is super cool. 
the host of the thing had some interesting questions. We got into, you know, cause it is a vegan restaurant, like what that's about and, you know, evolution of all this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, now that we are out of the pandemic, I mean, now it's just like, you know, you're going to in some ways pine for the way things were or whatever, but it's never keeping still, but it's nice to be reminded that it is like people like Olga and Vlad and, you know, our community of like music people and you were there and it kind of felt like some sort of thing that they would do in the 60s, you know, where people like get together and just right. talk. You right. know what I mean? I knew that he was from Odessa, but mm-hmm. I didn't know that his wife was from Chernivtsi in Ukraine. I was feeling even more so home, of course, because of that. And uh, it's super actually cool what they're doing as far as like rebirth of re- rebuilding the community. Yeah. You know, and rebuilding it around something that has aesthetic, just healthy kind of clear-headed eating plus you know just kind of connecting dots between several scenes i mean mostly hardcore and punk scene of new york even those scenes are going through re-energizing moments for sure we're still riding that wave i mean yeah it's, it's amazing and i think like you know going back to vlad and olga and like you know how they're like immigrants coming in and like how new york city is that and like how, you know, you and I are both like musicians, like we may somehow like through guitar and all this stuff, we're like traveling the world and doing all these things. Like that's how those guys are with food, building a community, creating a space where people will get together and enjoy something in some sort of communal way. And the new location is awesome, too. For sure. Next to the Blue Note. Yeah. You ever see anybody good at the Blue Note? Uh, you know, last time it was Cheek Korea and with Marcus Miller. Awesome. So George. Wow. Yes. I mean, I saw so George there two or three times because after living in Brazil for so many years, I could never not be down with that vibe. I'll be down with that vibe forever, you know. I think that's a good vibe for anybody. People should get that vibe whenever they can. I love Blue Note because it's just like one of these places like where like a CBGB is like you imagine it being like sort of massive and all this kind of, but it's kind of like a humble space in a way. Yeah, it is. And another... Another place that just IFC is right across the street too. So, you know, it's kind of like, here we go. It's New York City. And mm-hmm. on one block, you got those three dope places. Yeah. And it's pretty dense, culturally dense environment. It's, it's super bumping. Yeah. So I didn't even know you're doing this because <laughs> I just saw pictures of you in Poland with youth of today. Oh, yeah. So that was like, well, like, Three days ago or like three, three weeks ago? Dude, time is going like that. But um, there was a, it was a few weeks back and it was really cool because I've never been to uh, Warsaw. I mean, I've been traveling since I was a teenager and never made it there. And uh, and I had a few days I went early to, to kind of soak it up. And it was awesome. It kind of reminds me, what you're saying about your friend from Berlin, it reminds me of Berlin like pre, like Berlin is still awesome, but it's like, you know, whatever. It's like anything. It's getting more expensive, blah, 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 blah. Right. Warsaw is like a, has a lot of the appeal of that, of what Berlin has. It was interesting being so close. I mean, from, you know, talking to you, especially being closer to the uh, the war in Ukraine because you're mad close and you can feel it everywhere around the city for sure. I wore my Kiev uh, hardcore shirt. Yes, I saw it. Yeah, people were stoked as hell. I got a lot of high fives on that one. You will be getting a lot more high fives on that T-shirt everywhere you go in Europe as, yeah. they're, as they're closing uh, visas for Russian Federation. For two months, we were out in Europe and, you know, all the way down through Scandinavia, down Estonia and Baltic countries, Latvia, Lithuania and uh, Poland. And the solidarity was just yeah. a thousand percent, you know. At this moment, it's like, you know, the the it's been in the news for so long that it's kind of some people already tipped over from the chair and fell backwards and just can't take it anymore Mm. a lot of people ask like how do i deal with it like what can i do you know because i'm like kind of burned out it's like don't you know just stop being super emotional about it it's not about that like we that's like that's lyrical and that's appreciated the empathy and all that but when it goes on for so long, it's important to switch into kind of being more of a pragmatic supporter. Mm-hmm. Just like do what you can. Don't get hysterical. There's so, always something you can do. 
whether it's, uh, you know, support humanitarian financially or, you know, if you are in charge of some kind of uh, one or another plateau, you know, media or whatever. It's interesting. The first time I ever went to Europe was with Youth of Today. Mm -hmm. And I think at that time, like Youth Today has this sort of like clean cut, like super hyper American image and coming over and playing like we played in East Germany, which was was a trip. We played in like um, Yugoslavia. We played in Prague in like 89 when the wall was still up. Wow. And for me, that was a trip, you know, growing up and like watching like Red Dawn and all these kind of American propaganda movies. Right. Uh, like, holy shit, you know, stripes. I'm behind the Iron Curtain. You know, this is this is right. a wild thing to where the wall coming down and like kind of, uh, you know, this like amazing sort of like respite from all that stress of like, okay, we're going to have nuclear war. Now we're not going to have nuclear war. Right. We're going to like, everyone's going to have all this freedom and all this stuff. And a lot of that is true. And a lot of that is real. And, you know, the societies started to come together and there's all this, you know, euphoria about it, but like history keeps like lurching backwards in some sort of way. It just feels like these forces are still churning and it's playing itself out. It's a very old place that's been like trotted back and forth by many, many armies and hordes and and all type of action took place there for thousands of years. Yeah. So it's almost like impossible from, you know, modern American point of view to wrap your hand around it. Yeah. The volumes of the history that are just much, much greater you know, that of recorded history. And so, you know, it's like, in a way, those places that you went, Czech Republic, you know, you said uh, Croatia, Poland, like yeah. those places are actually, if you were living in like Soviet Union at the time, those places were still very, very Western spirit that they were never fully conquered yeah you know their their resistance was always there and uh, similar with Ukraine it it was uh, roped into Soviet Union with you know because it's just really that close but never gave up and uh, here it's making its way back to full independence and victory and uh, that trajectory but those places you know especially Czech Republic and Poland I felt like they were like so far advanced uh, as right. far as communication with the world goes. Yeah, yeah. Like that, the, the fractions of uh, of you know dictatorship that they had, they were just kind of like it was like no really. It was more chill dictatorship. It wasn't chilled. It was still mm-hmm. nasty, but the, I think the people, their mentality, did not get corrupted by it at all. Yeah, which is like why you know like. It's funny to hear when people talk about like Kogel Bordello is kind of like this band from kind of kind of springs out from behind the Iron Curtain. But it's not really true. Actually, some of the most fundamental people in punk rock were from Eastern Europe. I don't know how this story is not really told, but yeah. like Ivan Kral, you know, who played in Patti Smith's band and uh, then played with Iggy for 10 years. Yeah. He's he's from Prague and he's born in Prague and he split with his parents because of soviet invasion in 1969 i believe so uh or or you know tommy ramon one fun you know starting member of ramones was born and raised in budapest and also left budapest as a refugee when soviet tanks rolled in those musicians were not just you know creating party music they had anger that was coming from real place for sure i think that they get consumed maybe in the new york story and when i think of gogo bordello of course i see it through you and and sergey and 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 boris but i also see it more through the prism of uh of new york right like that is what new york is right of course it's also it's like where things germinate here and just kind of like launch it serves a function to the world that i think is sort of you know other cities have it to some degree but new york is the one no it can't this band could clearly come together only in new york city uh, it's a special place i was reading about when i say reading i mean listening to a podcast about revolutions and it's talking about how um you know the, the sector of the soviet revolution the you know lenin all that kind of stuff so there's all these different socialist republics and it's not like the bolsheviks had a grip on all of it 
Like there's no. civil wars, there's all these different factions fighting. And, you know, it only kind of like manages to sort of coalesce, like maybe in the thirties. And there was this one guy, and I'm wondering if you like know, have heard about it, but there was a whole area of Ukraine was held by this one dude that was an anarchist. And he was running like this massive territory. Of course. Gulag Pole. Yeah. Okay. So he yeah. maybe you can tell me about him. So you got it pretty accurately down. Uh, his name was Nestor Machno. Yes. So, uh, yes, he was a very uh, dedicated anarchist and he had a full, full program. And like they took an area down, they squatted basically, you know, a large area where they had several divisions that were paramilitary, some military, and some uh, were uh, with, with infrastructure of like educational system, you know, just trying to raise upcoming generation in a more progressive spirit. And it was like deeply rooted in like Proudhon and like original anarchist writings, like, you know, no uh, property and all that. They were very deep and dedicated. And at that time, they read that whole chaos as a time of promise, as in Tao had said, chaos is the possibility. It's a time of growth and opportunity and all of that kind of kind of uh, philosophy. So they really tried to raise this beautiful lotus in the middle of chaos. But, you know, what's the chances when you have like, you know, essentially a terroristic state of Moscow doing what they always do, you know, so they get squashed. His story was very interesting to me that he had like, like who the hell else gets to like have this massive swath of land like running? I mean, we think of anarchy. I mean, my the first time I ever heard about anarchy was straight up from Sex Pistols. So to me, right, anarchy right. is just like spitting on things and being uh, antisocial, basically. Right. But, um, you know, this time in the early 20th century is like riffing off of all these different kinds of kind of challenges to these monarchical systems. Marx is obviously the most, you know, interpreted and run with. But um, like, I can't think of who the anarchist writers are, but we're just like, shit was so bad and so crazy in czarist times. The system was so whack that like it created an opening for people to just try some shit out. And anarchy, obviously it didn't work in that case, but yeah, of course you have the Bolsheviks wanting to to win and you have the, the whites, you know, the, you know the, the whites were not trying to like let an anarchist state be those are dictatorship structures you know tsar tsars and bolsheviks i mean fuck all of that in a way anarchism could be you know i'm, I'm sure there's tons of people who are listening who are aware on larger scale of what it is but it's as you were saying it's absolutely not what people think it is yeah it's actually would be most organized thing ever you know it takes quite evolved state of mind and yeah well, that's rare. <laughs> yeah, but, I don't know uh, if human beings are mentally or spiritually evolved enough necessarily, but when they tried to do it, it was definitely because uh, Nestor was was a was a fighter, bro. He, well, but but they were it was working for a while. Yeah, it's not like it was working for two weeks. Already by that time, industrial revolution was so uh, you know it's already imposed its insanity onto people. I mean. You know, yeah. people were working eight, 10 hours a day already back then. And yeah. little kids, and, too. And uh, of course, some people started getting onto, onto other lifestyle. And that anarchist idea kind of sprang out from there that life doesn't have to be so at all. Like, we don't have to do any of these things since we can work two hours a day and get much farther. We just don't need to live in such an incredibly large uh states with such a incredibly rigid infrastructures and that, that need to take such an insane effort to control. So what he was suggesting is basically, you know, what a lot of people go now for, like by moving somewhere into the boonies and uh, trying to, you know, leave behind their corporate career and things like that, you know. Yeah. You and I are both bands, bands kind of people, like our band is our lifestyle, you know. And the band itself, like the occurrence of the band, is a kind of a manifestation of that within this frame that we exist, yeah. you know, because it's not like there was 
a lot of bands before uh, 60s. Like there wasn't. No, there, wasn't there, were, there were big bands and there were solo voices or, you know, soloists. Yeah. And there was some vaudeville groups. Yeah. But, but there was no like the idea of like three, four people, three, four, five, six people mm. that are just this kind of like invented family was not a thing to do. And as the pressures rose of, you know, trying to curve out for yourself some kind of destiny where like you don't have to deal with the insanity of this, all these pressures. I think, I think that the band uh, idea became very popular because it is that. It's like a super small a way to um, grow your own lotus. And let's not over romanticize it. That comes with tons of... <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. not for everybody. It's not for everybody. Yeah, it will fucking kill you if you don't know how to properly yeah. get out there. But you know what I mean? I always thought that that is why bands continue to be so um, popular as, a, as just a way of living. Even if they're like uh, not successful, like, even the bands that are not successful, it's still yeah. a fucking great way of living. There's a way to like subvert with a group of people, like like-minded people, like doing all the problem solving, the creativity, the right. endurance, the, the celebration, the uh, the risk, all those kind of things. And also that you're subverting the, like you described as like these pressures, these kind of systematic things that are boxing you in to like, well, you know, a normal person, would be like, oh, well, I've got to go to college. And if I'm going to go to college, I got to get it in this sort of way that is going to create a form of employment so that I can fit the model of like what a good life is. And like someone else is like, that's someone else's idea being kind of grafted upon to your mind. Whereas like if you're in a band and you can kind of subvert that and maybe to one degree or another, discover different possibilities and maybe realize your things about yourself that you wouldn't have known otherwise. If the idea of a life, which is like to be a kind of trolley bus, which is just this, goes through these regimented things, school, you know, college, job, fucking mortgage, whatever, doesn't appeal to you, then band suddenly presents itself as a very uh, great oasis to get away from it all. And if things go well, even possibly make a living. There's also tons of limitations. Suddenly, you know, the first oasis of freedom like becomes very, there's like a whole code and a regiment of how this scene works. And so uh -huh. you're like frowned upon if you're like bringing in elements of another scene, yes. at least at least in the beginning stages of it. So, but in a way through band, through band, you surpass all of that again, because it's like one of the great thing about being an artist, I don't know, in my opinion, is like you can be totally wrong and still be good artist. It's a different kind of responsibility. You are there to elevate and like take people on the flight. And as long as they're off the ground, you're doing it. And then they're out on their own to make their own decisions farther. For example, in Ukraine, where I was already in a band, uh, you know, in a punk band starting 14, 15, and 16 years old, it was kind of frowned upon to be athletic because punk rock wasn't about that. Like it was about being uh, eccentric, uh, intellectual, you know, a super fringe character who can just persevere against all odds, but not necessarily with any kind of athletic side. And uh, yeah, as a, since I was like coming from that like long distance runner background. Yeah which is something you also don't brag about, but I, I finally caught you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just insane that, you know, I know you for so many years, and the first time that I saw <laughs> the whole topic came up is because I saw you on Instagram that you did the marathon. I love it. I mean, it, we're in, in, we're praising our cool band lifestyle, but a lot of it is like you're in jail. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you're stuck at the club and, you know, or at a festival and you're kind of confined to that space and you're socially confined with the people that you're with and stuff like that. And they could be the coolest people in the world, but you need to find space. And so uh, for me, I love to run when I'm on tour and check out a city and see the wider lay of the land, right. get back for sound check, 
everybody's there. So that's super American uh, punk rock way, actually. That's like, like in Europe, that's like literally a no-go. Like that is so not fucking cool. <laughs> Our most biggest influences were from Berlin and London and uh, yeah. like the whole like Gang of Four, I should tell oh, yeah. about and yeah, the clash. Like, it's just, a Bargeld's not like running around the town before the show. No, but Henry Rollins does. Henry Rollins, yeah. Exactly. So for me, it was actually really liberating in the sense to when I came here. Yeah. Just that whole like skate punk connection yeah. and not even necessarily the music of it. Like, yeah. But once I saw the token entry album cover, you know, with yeah. Jay Bird with a with a skateboard on, I was like, I had skateboard back in Ukraine. I mean, I was complete anomaly. Like I never got good. There was no gang for yeah. me to be with. I was like 10 years old with a skateboard and people were like, why are you doing this? Once I came here, I was like, wait a second. There is this whole subculture where that's completely married and uh, and living f- happily forever after. Yeah. Through the band, you can surpass all those limitations of one scene and yeah. marry them all in your band. Maybe it's like that West Coast, like kind of punk aesthetic that kind of came into it because there's a lot of like skateboarding and surfing and that kind of stuff. All right. That was coming from West Coast. I think more so because skateboarding is like, I just associate that with, you know, West Coast, like lifestyle. But I think but the token entry. Oh, Rollins, oh yeah, right. token entry, of course. That's like 87 or so, it is 88. I knew the token entry guys. They're all riffing on like aggression, uh, JFA, right. who are actually from Arizona. But yeah, I do love, Rollins, I think, did a lot for that kind of like, it's okay to like, lift weights or whatever and uh yeah and, yeah totally and that's part of it but you um so you were a long distance runner in school right it was way beyond school it wasn't like high school sports we were kind of on a city team that city team that was preparing serious athletes and you know since i was eight. Oh damn so we want to pull out our times you know and compare <laughs> Oh, dude, no, I think you'd probably dust me. Once I got into apps, I started to try to like beat myself a little bit, you know, like do better at it. But I'm that's more recently that I've gotten more like competitive with myself. But generally, I was more of a solo guy. So it's right, right. like taking in the experience and just like enjoying the landscape, you know. Training that mind goes through while doing long distance, you know, running like 20 kilometers when you're like 13 or 14. Well, all your peers are sleeping because it's sunday yeah. and you're like out in a frozen forest you know mm-hmm. with like plastic duct tape bags all over your feet because it's you know it's sleet and it's you yeah. know you're like one step off and you're like in swamp land and you know and, and, and it's just like i remember we we're doing that all the time just actually duct tape our feet with plastic bags up until up to the knees and you're just doing that when you know you could be doing some really relaxing things and it's beyond stadium. It's not in an in a arena. It's out there. You're just like in the wilderness running by yourself. I mean, uh, some of it was actually, in the retrospect, it was pretty uh, damaging, maybe in some way. If we would not survive it, it would be very damaging. Yes, we wouldn't be talking about it now. <laughs> yes. But it came close to being like, hey, like, why am I here in the middle of this forest, like 10 kilometers in? And it's like minus 15 celsius and you're like 13 years old and so a lot of training for the mind to do to just like even that situation out and be like okay i'm doing it because i signed up for it yeah so i don't think i would have that kind of same skill and knack for long distance touring which later on came up you know it's very similar to a long tour or a making an album there's so many small decisions and moments where you can get beat and you know where you have to like kind of check where you're at like how are you feeling what's working what's not working and i find like being on a tour like mentally that kind of shit definitely comes into play yeah and then making a record or any sort of creative project 
I mean, I think in long distance terms, I think of making an album because there's just so many levels and decisions that have to be made. Mental, mental stamina. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, and you're pretty good at that because you know, we just made a record together and I saw yeah. it. Yeah, dude. Same. <laughs> I have a certain amount of like energy, you know, that you feel even when you're on stage, like, especially coming up in like, you know, youth of today or like, and I see you in Gogo Bordello, it's like high energy. It's like you're dancing your ass off the whole time. You know, you have that energy. It's just like whatever God gave you that spark, but your body will, will quit on you if you don't like manage it and pick your spots. And um, I find that plays itself out in a long run. Cause like, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. I'm not feeling good, mm -hmm. you know? And how do I like get through this stretch that I'm not feeling good? I think that that stamina is probably like the most important thing for life. I think that I kind of like just whenever there is a, a time to, to bring it up, long distance running is just such a unlikely thing to recommend, but it's such a fundamentally important skill. It's just so deeply meditative, actually. Absolutely. Yeah, you're on your own. You're not like distracted. You're not doing anything but managing your energy. And life is all about energy management. You don't manage it, you're going to be in a ditch, you know. 100%, man. <laughs> like both my parents ran, but it was like in the 70s, you know, so I think everybody was kind of trying that out when I was when I was little. Right. It's sort of like if you run for a little while, it's like, okay, I just want to stop. Like, what's the point? <laughs> Ah, just because you didn't hit the endorphins. Exactly. You have to get past that point. Where <laughs> yeah. you're just like you didn't know, get high yet. Yeah. And yeah, and then you then your body and your mind, of course, they're working together, but your body's just going. I have a dog, so it's like when she's like running, she's not thinking, "Oh, I'm running," and this is causing. No, she's just running. She's having fun. So, like, I think of my body in that way sometimes. Like, oh, look at you! You're having fun. You you run along. Maybe there's some sort of issue or problem or or whatever that I'm having a hard time getting my mind around. And a lot of times when I'm on a run, I'll be kind of like working that out. And then, uh, right, right, right. and I find out I just ran like four miles and I've solved a problem. You know what I mean? A lot of that energy is definitely in, in, in the album we made because yeah. you represent it as far as, you know, going for long days of mixing without having any kind of dips. No. And so, so in that way, we really, um, were writing the same way. That was a great collaboration Yeah, that I think was meant to happen because it's like it seems like we were on each other's orbits forever. Sure. And then, yeah. then this, and now that I look back into like my record collection, I just you know like quicksand for a seven inch, and and uh, you know youth of today, war zone, uh, grill biscuits, of course, and uh, rival schools, which somehow were off my radar, but now that I got it under microscope, I'm pretty psyched for the you know the. The reunion shows and the re-release -re yeah it's gonna be awesome man yeah i'm really psyched for it i mean it's um my career has been yeah all these different bands you know projects and collaborations which has been so awesome because i've had so many interesting different kinds of experiences and i've gone across a lot of different genres and worked with amazing people and like by these different configurations like different stuff kind of comes out of me it's been nice to have rival schools like not it hasn't been my primary focus but i'm very excited to like revisit that stuff and hang with my guys and also you know all the people that kind of like the community that came together around that band and and that time in my life you were able to reach out and create all these various band entities and which brings out different sides of you i've been overviewing that body of work and you know suddenly the, there's on a quicksand seven inch there is like a trumpet jazzed out solo mm -hmm. and it's definitely yeah. coming from somewhere else yeah it's, it's not a raffinated uh new york hardcore it was yeah. like it's just like you know it's a synthesis and then there's you know a very melodic approach and grill biscuits and you know sudden harmonica solo which also blows people out of the water in the same time Quicksand and, and rival schools, there's most of the people in them are all from hardcore bands. Yeah. yeah. So, it, so it is a home base. And it's yeah. a, you know, you know, like going out there doing these different things, but the home base remains to be that. It yeah. still cycles back to the hardcore as a unifying, uh, as a central, central aesthetic. 
it wasn't realistic to me to be like, I'm going to make it in show business. Like not at all, <laughs> but like, but if I could play CBGBs with my crappy guitar skills, like that's, a, that's maybe an achievable goal. And someone puts out a, a demo tape and it's got like a really good mosh part on it. Like you right. want to get some of that and you want to be a part of that conversation. I went to high school with these kind of like metal dudes that ripped on guitar, had like the, the look and the whole thing. And, you know, they were kind of like dreaming from some sort of like fantasy lifestyle that's being presented to them, which if you achieve it, I'm sure is a hell of a ride. You know what I mean? But I knew that I wouldn't, A, that wasn't my aesthetic and B, I didn't have the chops, but punk rock, hardcore, that sort of like community based this sort of like folk music aspect where it's yeah, like absolutely. localized, where it's like your village is yeah. creating this music for the villagers who live in the village. Right. And, and everyone can play freaking a little bit of accordion. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And, and it's about taking flight in the way that you said, like, even if you're doing it wrong, if you take flight with it and just dive off the fucking cliff, that's going to, that's going to hit people. And, and that's how it hit me. I like the village analogy. And um, I mean, it is East Village after all. For, yeah, it's literally a it's Like people who experience that like uh, punk and hardcore kind of catharsis, tribal catharsis together, they will never let it go. You, you know? get a certain set of references that and certain energies like that. Um, that's just common language. I also enjoy playing with people that don't have that frame of reference for myself to like to see how I am outside of that you know what I mean but I, I you know I made my best friendships and I met super cool people at a young age and some of the greatest riches of, of my career is that I've like discovered not only like you know talented musicians you know for what that's worth but right. like people that I can relate to that I can do creative things with and have fun with that there's like a, a natural, you know, sort of synergy and chemistry and, you know, that I'm still on that trip is like, yeah, that's, I'm grateful for that. I guess our like kind of one of our goals was just kind of give this idea like of sim symphonic punk. If that, yeah. I mean, obviously it's a oxymoron, but kind of we gave it our best shot. And I think that, like by the seekers and finders that's basically that idea peaked you know how much more uh, baroque does it need to get i think a lot of the classical elements started really fighting with uh, with the rawness and uh and that's kind of that's why what we did now is kind of already it's like we did the full circle going yeah. back to the to the rawness and and songwriting that just instant instant uh impact you know with you know instant impact as as as, as you know as as chromax instant impact just hard times that's all you get when we were mixing the record it really just keeps carrying you on because there's all these different elements that are like falling from the sky and and falling into places and we were just sort of like finding those little spots and right. featuring them to different degrees and um you really the energy it's just like your live set but e even in the in the in the mix of it is just like grasping these things of course there's a plot behind it but it seems like a lot of it is really just falling from the sky I'm discovering things from like that were before I was born and discovering them and just being like, how the hell did I get as old as I am now and not know about this thing that it just keeps because I'm changing. I'm becoming more open to different kinds of things. And I'm curious about things that maybe wouldn't just have passed me by at a different time in my life people will talk to me about bands, especially when I was like touring a lot. Like there's just certain bands that were like amazing. And I was just so on my own trip that I just had no time to like know about it really. Yeah. That happens. And I'll catch up with it now sometimes and be like, Oh shit. That's what all those people were excited about. Now I can, I can dig it. It's over, but I can dig it. I picked up a couple of bands from you that I really been digging. I mean, Mind Force, Scowl, there's a lot. I'm nervous hardcore is going to actually really be popular. You know, I, <laughs> I, I, don't um, root, I don't want to root against it, but it's like, it's like, whoa, whoa. Is it really popular now? Like, you know, what is, what does that do? I think it's just people grab into it more because it's been very difficult years and like people just grabbing towards anything that's like 
sustainable and has resilience and kind of help them to jumpstart and rebuild mm-hmm. and something where like there's certain integrity involved and something where like people mean what they say you know, and say what they mean i mean look at where we're living it's a hybrid it's a hybrid you know war i mean people people in in russia are complete, convinced that there is no war going on well full right. war is going on in fact they're put, you know put in jail if they say that word war you know the absurdity of fictionalized entities that we're experiencing is is if somebody doesn't have their head together they read it into it as a tangible reality you know that's why i think people are gravitating towards you know after the pandemic and several other you know mishaps and, and especially of course war uh, the, the russian invasion onto ukraine confuses people a lot because there is just it's a faucet of uh of faucet of propaganda and lying that surrounds it Obviously, it's a fight of people for their independent destiny, and it's about as clear as it gets if you have your head together. But you know, mental health is pretty rare these days. And uh, if you ask me, that's why people probably gravitate towards things that are more tangible, including music and hardcore. For young generations, they're they're growing up in a in, in a hologramic reality where you know. For all they know, music is created inside of the iPhone. I mean, what's yeah. their point of reference? They don't have it. But another thing is that for older generations, their world is also falling apart in the front of their face. Their major points of reference is fading into background as we speak, yeah. becoming completely obsolete. I like your theory about the the hardcore, where it's something sort of authentic and kind of... It's just interesting that coming out of the pandemic, that now's the time that this is... Uh, seems to be breaking through to in some small way to the mainstream. I think in a normal like human evolution, like you go through your youth, you go through these different times and then things naturally change. Like New York City, people are critical of New York City. Like, oh, it's it's not like good like it used to be before and all this kind of crap. But you have to come to grips with that because like when you were in New York City in your whatever prime year that you were there, there was someone coming to grips with like that it had changed under their feet. But I think it's like accelerated and more confusing because any sort of say a conflict in in war in Ukraine, like there's so many different angles on these different things that people's minds are just like tweaked out from it. It's everybody's own responsibility to become like your own disinformation uh, expert. You know, there, there's no other way. Like nobody else is coming. Yeah. Nobody, nobody's gonna do that job for you. You know. I mean, it's always been like that, but yeah. since everything has accelerated, your own responsibility to become your own disinformation expert has accelerated. You know. It's what the times call for, and you gotta like adapt, get into it. Yeah. So, man, cool hang. Yeah. Great to talk to you again. We still have so much to talk about. But yeah, good time, man. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for listening to the TalkHouse podcast. And thanks to Eugene Hutz and Walter Schreifels for chatting. If you like what you heard, please follow TalkHouse on your favorite podcasting platform and check out all we have to offer on TalkHouse.com. This episode was produced by Myron Kaplan and the TalkHouse theme is composed and performed by The Range. See you next time.